so welcome everyone uh, welcome so uh, to this uh, wonderful session and let me introduce you uh, today's speaker uh, mr parag uh, ambardekar uh, so parag immigrated to the usa in 1979 uh, after working 15 years and managing some high profile high tech nasa programs he worked in the field of management consulting with ibm and accenture in senior and executive positions before starting his own business in management consulting uh, he has a masters degree in computer science from john hopkins an executive mba from george mason university and a master of science degree in statistics from india since his retirement 3 years ago he volunteered for aarp tax prep service teaches operations management courses occasionally as an adjunct faculty in the pentagon and andrews air force base and pursues professional speaking wine tasting and travel as his hobbies so now let's hear um, how uh, and what he learned about wine tasting so welcome uh, parag ambardekar and over to you okay uh, thank you thank you anirudh i suppose everybody can hear me and aniruddha while we are doing this right uh, if nobody says no in next 5 seconds then uh, i'm going to proceed with the disclaimer and warning uh, which is important before we start our presentation uh, first of all this program is for adults 21 years of age and older if there is anybody on the uh, call who is under age 21 uh you may watch the presentation only with your parents and and parental consent neither marathi kala mandal nor uttaranga nor i encourage alcohol consumption this presentation is for responsible adults who know the enjoyment of alcoholic beverages comes only from moderate and responsible consumption now that the disclaimer and the warning has been given uh we can start with the with the presentation uh anirudh are you there yes i am here i i'm not able to turn the slide are you able to uh no you should be uh enter the arrow keys uh yeah it's not, it's not happening <laughs> okay press the escape key okay okay yeah. now you can go to the yeah. okay. we are still able to see yeah. it yeah okay uh thank you uh anyway so today's topic is wine tasting uh and we'll be covering tasting basics tips and trivia uh i have my email here and before i get into the presentation couple of uh, sort of housekeeping things uh i depending on how we are doing on time it's only 20 slides that i have but depending on how we are doing on time i might allow some questions to be asked uh before i finish the presentation but whether i do that or not i am i mean we will always have time at the end for the questions you may text your questions so the moderator and the mkm president aniruddh he, the he can you know line up the questions in the order in which they are received or you can ask verbally at the end uh i guess uh, with that i'm going to uh, proceed the the outline of the presentation is we we will talk about the present presentation objectives then we will get into testing basics that's where we'll spend uh, about half an hour uh and then we'll discuss test enhancing tips price drivers for wine buying tips and 
some important historical notes, which are more or less, you can say, very interesting, but important wine trivia. So there are kind of four objectives. The very first one is the most important. Uh, this is to make ourselves familiar with wine tasting basics. What does it include? What, uh, what are the factors that you look at when you taste wine and you assess wine and even you buy wine? Uh, after this presentation, hopefully, you will be able to describe what type of wine you like. Uh, and again, it may be a uh, little too early, but when I say what type of wine you like, it's a little more specific than I don't like uh, sweet wines or I like sweet wines. It's a little more than that. And hopefully you will be able to say the way I'm going to say as to the kind of wine that I like. Uh, if I go to a restaurant and a sommelier asks me, what type of wine do you like? Then I say, I like semi-dry wines uh, that have medium to heavy body with a little bit of oak and a good finish. Now it may sound Greek to you right now, but hopefully by the time we finish the presentation, you will uh, you'll be able to say that with a little more practice and a few more wines tested with what I'm discussing here uh, today. Of course, because this is a remote call and uh, uh, we are using Zoom, we can do that. Uh, other times when I do this presentation, it's generally followed with tasting three or four wines and applying the concepts that I'll be discussing in these slides. So anyway, you can do that later on, uh, on your time. Uh, the third thing is like, you'll be able to talk about wines with a little bit of an ease and at social and business function. And you will get better value for your wine dollars that you spend. And this is important because uh, this is where I want to Ind indicate as to how I learned about wines and what I learned. Uh, and it relates to the third bullet. When I was with IBM and Accenture, I was traveling 100% and I was in a senior position many times managing all the engagements within a Fortune 500 client. So in a commercial world, Unlike government contracting, it's very common to entertain clients once a week or twice, you know, once every two weeks. And my clients were senior VPs, executive VPs, CFOs, and sometimes CEOs. So I used to be lost completely. And if I was paying with my company's expense hard, Generally, the, as you know, most of you know, uh, the convention is the person who is paying the bill picks the wine. So I, I used to be drinking scotch only at that time, and I used to surrender. And there was one time when my boss was there also visiting us and our client. And after the meeting, this was when I was in Accenture. After the meeting, he kind of told me, he says, Parag, uh, I'm surprised you don't know anything about wines. Uh, this is not good for your image and the image of Accenture, believe it or not. <laughs> and he says, you need to get familiar with wines. So I started looking at, <laughs> uh, I started looking at, uh, courses that I could take. And around that time, I also had another client local in Alexandria, Old Town Alexandria. And one day I was visit, taking my client to, uh, uh, to a 
for a drink in a uh, you know, nearby restaurant and bar. And there was a big buzz going on. It was a upscale restaurant, French. And uh, he, the, uh, there was apparently a five course wine tasting and food pairing dinner at that restaurant. And they had invited a French wine master. So he came there half an hour early before their thing. And uh, uh, I, realized that what was happening. So I just went up to him and I said, I am interested in wines. I want to learn about it. And what do you suggest? Uh, what course should I take? And he said, are you trying to get a job as a wine consultant for a restaurant or some distributor? I said, no. And so he said, don't spend your money. Actually, he said, don't waste your money on these courses. He says, I'll give you a couple of books, read them and experiment them, and then you will learn over time. And I said, maybe it was just one wine master who had that. So I repeated that thing in that restaurant two or three more times. And an Italian winemaker and California winemaker, they all told me the same thing. If, I, it, it, if it was my hobby, I wanted to enjoy wines more and learn more. I didn't need to go for that. And so I followed their advice, bought the books they had said and started reading and making notes and observing. And that was 20 years ago. So over the last 20 years, I have kind of acquired, so to say, whatever I'm sharing with you today. Uh, so with that, so I don't have a diploma or a piece of paper to show you that I, I completed a such and such wine tasting course, but uh, I think I have 20 years and some great recommendations that these people made. And I used to also ask them. So anyway, with that long introduction, let's get into the actual presentation. Wine tasting is a sensory experience, uh, requires all the senses except the sense of hearing, uh, really. And, you know, eyes, nose, tongue, it's very, very easy to uh, figure out. But some of you may be wondering what touch is, and that is to figure out the finish of the wine. And we will cover that in the next few slides. There are two methods of wine tasting. One emphasizes assessment mainly through your eyes and nose. And it may be hard for you to do that. I mean, you can uh, assess all the aspects with nose and ear, I mean, nose and eyes, but uh, you do do a lot, you can do a lot of assessment if you have experience. It's, this method is hard for newcomers, but it's popular with the professionals. And so we are going to focus on method two, which is, which uh, uses eyes, nose, tongue, and throat for testing. It's kind of easy to grasp and uh, it's very popular. So the rest of the presentation, we are going to focus just on method two. So now let's see what are the different aspects of wine that uh, you, can, you can taste and appreciate. And there are eight standard ones. Uh, the one on the left are relatively easy to taste, you know, color and appearance, aroma, acidity, body, finish. And then there are some that are hard to taste, uh, like balance, tannins, and minerality. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a couple of minutes on each one of those uh, and see what, what we can do and what are, which way you can test it better. Before I get into the nitty gritty, uh, I want to caution you on terminology. 
there is no standardization on wine terminology. And so the same aspect or the same thing can appear in multiple different uh, ways because what people are comfortable using it. So aroma of a wine may be described as nose or flavors. Degree of acidity can be described as dry, semi-sweet, sweet, whatever. And I know some of you engineers, and especially those who are in the chemical engineering, they are wondering how can acidity be, you know, the same as uh, or opposite of sweet. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then tannins in a wine are sometimes described as astringency. So don't get confused with that. I just wanted to, I'm going to use the terminology that is easy to grasp and we will stick with that. But keep in mind that aroma may be described as nose uh, or flavor. So uh, anyway, so the first aspect of wine tasting is color and appearance. So what is a good color for wine? And it really depends on the grape and the type of wine. Uh, mainly if it's white, it's a different, and for red, it's another one, standard. But even among reds and even among whites, you will have different, uh, you will have different, uh, color standards as, as to what is a good color. Uh, the color, when you, when you hold a glass of, let's say, a white wine, the color must be bright and clear, especially for white wine. Uh, and if you are, I'm just going to give examples of some uh, very common uh, and popular wines like if you take chardonnay chardonnay a good chardonnay would have a light lemon color and it would be very bright and clear when you when you uh, kind of look at the glass the other wines the italian wines like pinot grigio or sauvignon blanc they will not be light lemon color. They will be even lighter. But the key thing there that you need to look at is, is it, does it look bright and clear? Uh, so that's for white wines. For red wines, again, it, it changes uh, depending on whether it's Pinot Noir, Cab, Malbec, sometimes it's garnet color, sometimes it's, it all depends on the wine, uh, I mean the grape, uh, but the bottom line is you, you, you need to hold the glass, look at that, look at the, uh, look at the wine and see the color. Uh, does it look muddy and kind of not really good? Does it show any wine residue uh, at the bottom of the glass? And that's, that's, that's why they kind of take a little bit of wine in the glass and they tilt the glass, have a paper napkin or dinner napkin on the table, kind of <laughs> that, and you see whether the border of of the wine where it is touching does, does it look okay uh, all right uh, so you can see a ring bluish and that's kind of advanced that's why i'm not demonstrating it here but that that's not a that's not a mark of a good wine if you see that kind of a bluish 
ring uh, near near the top when you tilt the glass a little bit and look at it. Uh, wine residue you can see sometimes in wines. It's generally harmless. Uh, it residue is seen more in red wines, and that happens mainly because the wine maker, the vintner, the vineyard, didn't uh, filter it, or it was not preserved very well. Where you you start forming. Uh, tannins start forming clusters and they collect at the bottom. It, it's really not harmless. But if you see that on a wine that is barely one or two years old, that is, that is a flag. Uh, so that, that, that's what we can talk about color and appearance. I'm just going to ask, are there any quick questions on this? No, nope, so far we don't have anything. And okay. I think we, let's go with the flow and we okay. will have the question at the end. Okay. The aroma. Uh, that's the second, uh, uh, second aspect that you generally, it's easy to see. Generally has aromas except for some white wines and depends again on the grape and the, what kind of aromas you get. So I have listed some common ones on white wines. Uh, you get fruit aromas, melons, lime, vanilla is very common. Uh, sometimes you get even uh, cardamom. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was having a wine that I had bought from Total Wines. It's uh, called River Road. Uh, Chardonnay from Russian River Valley, and it has a very nice cardamom uh, flavor also. Not overpowering, but background. Uh, on red wines, you typically get berries, currant, chocolate, and sometimes even cinnamon, very light. Uh, there are literally about 45 to 50 different types of uh, flavors you can get. And it is the decision of the winemaker uh, to really decide what sort of uh, flavors he or she is going to have in the final product. The tasting tip. Uh, the wine stays bottled up for months or sometimes two, three, four years. So you need to loosen the flavors. That's why they swirl the grass gently and carefully so uh, it won't spill, but it would loosen the flavors. There are other ways of actually getting, uh, letting out flavors. Uh, there are certain tools that we will talk about later on in the presentation. But for now, I'm just giving you the very basic you can do without, uh, without using any tool. Another wine tip that I have not put on this is if you want to see the aroma, don't necessarily decide what aroma it has. It, you, you need to kind of sniff the wine after swirling the glass two to three times. And on the third time, what you get is more correct. It's hard. It's not, it's not very easy. But if you kind of try it a few times, you will, you will get the hang of it and you will be able to see what all you have. And the other thing is these days on Google, you have everything on Google, put the name of the wine, it will tell you. And there are, if you see, there are certain things that will give you the tasting notes. It will have certain flavors. And then you can, you can say, okay, it has melons. So 
this wine. So I'm going to see whether I can detect melons. But that's how you will you'll it, you'll be able to do uh, more and more uh, calling the flavors on a wine and enjoy the wine a little more. Acidity. I talked about this earlier that when it as it relates to wine, the acidity and sweetness are kind of opposites. And let me let me explain that a bit. See, when the grape is there on the wine initially, it is all acid and very little, if any, sugar. And as it stays there in the sun and gets moderate amount of rain, then the ripening process of the grape starts. And during this ripening process, the acidity starts going down and the sweetness starts going up. That's why in the case of wine, Acidity is the opposite of uh, sweetness. So if there is more acid in a wine, it's, it has less sugar. And when it's very sweet wine like Moscato, it, it has very little acid. And again, uh, how much acidity or how much sweetness a particular wine will have, again, depends on the vineyard and mainly on the wine master who is in charge of making the decisions related to wine. White wines have less or no tannins because they are made from the juice of the grape, not the grape skins. But they still have a little bit of wine, I mean, a little bit of tannins. They are hard to, tannin is hard to taste and generally, the best way to taste that is on the back of your tongue, where bitterness can be tasted. Uh, same wines I'm giving as examples uh, that have very good tannins, and they will have that soft, velvety feel, all the way from this $20 Iter bottle to $80 to $120 Camus so. Uh, cab, cab. This is the last aspect, and perhaps after this, if there are any questions, uh, can open it up for uh, questions. It's uh, four fifteen, and uh, I think we are doing well on time. But uh, anyway, last thing is minerality. Uh, it's very difficult to explain, and a very controversial aspect. Uh, the best way to describe that is really it's a stony taste. Generally, I mean, not generally, it's most of the time it's only in white wines that have crisp acidity and lower alcohol. That's where you can, you can taste. Most people do not like that minerally feeling. You know it when you taste it. It's unmistakable. But one of the wines that, that has a very good minerality without affecting the overall taste is this Miomi Chardonnay from California. Decent price, if you ever get a chance to have that, taste it and then you will, you will see what I'm talking about. Uh, the minerality depends on the soil structure where the vineyard is. And that's why most of the Euro Eastern European wines and some French wines, some regions of France, they, they will have minerality. You cannot add minerality to the wine. So uh, anyway, uh, that's that. So there are a couple of taste enhancing tips, but I'm just asking, are there any burning questions? Are you getting any questions, Aniruddha? 
Yes, we, we got uh, a couple of questions. So let me go and read it for you. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what aspects of wine are affected by age? Why is age so important? Okay. Uh, when you age the wines, like I said, the tannins get resolved. They become smooth. Uh, that's, that's number one. Uh, the other thing is, usually wines are matured for some time, at least, in oak barrels or oak casks. And when you store it in oak, it gives, it enhances the flavors of the wine and it kind of gives a very light, oaky, toasted taste to the wine. So when you, when you age the wines, uh, those are the two aspects that really get enhanced. And, but if I may say so, this is like aging the wine is becoming, as wine industry calls it, old, old school in quotes concept because old school was you know you mature the red wines especially multiple years then the price goes up vineyard makes more money people are happy willing to pay the price uh, but over the years the french oak casks or barrels have started in short have become short in short supply and they have become expensive to the point where many small to medium sized vineyards can't afford to really do a store in french oak casks for a not even for a year or two uh, and so that's when they started the old school and they found a method of aging them in stainless steel containers that do not give as much flavor and as much oaky feeling, but uh, it also is good for the price and younger people are able to afford those wines. So anyway, pretty long, uh, uh, hopefully I answered the question. So what's the next one? And on the on the similar uh, line, uh, there's another question which says that uh, is older the wine the better? I mean, um, we might have heard uh, mixed reviews or mixed views from the bartender, uh, particularly in the Texas bars, uh, which serves expensive wines. That these are the old wines; we do not guarantee their test. So, is older the wine the better? It depends on how well it is preserved and what type of wine it is. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, white wines, generally white wines that are available in the retail store, the white wines, those wines have maximum of five year life. So you will rarely find white wine preserved for years and years and years. Uh, there are some, like in 2008, I was in Paris and I went to a formal French restaurant and their wine list was 32 pages and I really surrendered. I said, I don't know what to drink. I am into wines, but uh, so then they said, you want to see our cellar? And I said, okay, show me your oldest white wine. They had a 1923 Gamay, white wine called Gamay. They showed me that. But the longer you serve, lo longer you preserve them, the longer, I mean, you have to record them a lot of times. And that's what I meant by preserving the wines well. What happens is the cork 
starts rotting literally if it is not uh, properly preserved and the best way to preserve the wine any wine even if you are going to consume it in two months is to keep it horizontal not vertical because that keeps the cork moist and it prevents decay so there are a lot of factors so it's true that old the older the wine the better it is is not necessarily true but for some well made wines older the wines is a good one it, to give you that example that i already talked about uh, on the previous slides camus cabernet is considered kind of the king of cabernet it's a california vineyard uh, wagner family owns the vineyard uh, the, their standard two year old cabernet is 80 dollars i have somebody gave me a gift of 2004 uh, came as Cabernet, which the price on Google at that time, which was about a year or two ago, was 134. So if it is well-made wine and preserved well, it obviously will be very good. But the two key things are well-made and well-preserved. And that is an iffy. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Yes. And then uh, next question what we have is that about uh, the wine color or aroma and taste uh, okay. are basically directly related to how the grapes used for making the wine are cultivated. Uh, it also depends upon the kind of soil on which grapes are grown. So depends upon the nutrients used to cultivate grapes. So what are your thoughts on these things? Uh, this is more like somebody is informing me about, about this than asking a question. So I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the first part of the question. On you. So it says that uh, the wine color, aroma and taste are directly related to how the grapes used for making the wine are cultivated. So depends upon the nutrition used for cultivates grapes does the taste or aroma may change it yeah i have a question and maybe a slight correction most of the aroma like i said chocolate and vanilla and all of that you don't get that from grape where does it come from it's not even additives it's not artificially added to give you that it really comes from the type of yeast that is that is used in wine making for the fermentation so uh, there are 10000 plus different types of yeast and it's the decision of the wine maker as to what type of wine and what type of taste does it need to have so that will tell you that the aromas Certain aroma, yeah, red wines, berries, it's a standard that is natural from the grape. That you will get that, but some of the other types of aromas really come from the type of yeast that you use. Uh, true, minerality, aspects like minerality come from the soil, but again, depending on what type of wine you are trying to make, they will adjust the fermentation process. They will do a lot of decisions. I mean, I don't know enough about the nitty gritty of the chemical and fermentation processes and the whole wine making from a manufacturer standpoint. I only know the aspects that are relevant to taste so yes it depends it, it has a basic taste that the soil would give and uh, the, the the example that i can give you is you take any white wine 
and especially Chardonnay from Australia, you will get a, like a zing on your, on your uh, uh, tongue, which is unmistakable. I can close my eye, blind test, somebody give me Australian wine, white wine, and I can tell you that this is from Australia, but that is all about soil. So in that sense, some basic taste will depend on the soil, but there is some room to maneuver it based on the wine making and uh, the rest of the process. So hopefully I answered that question. Yeah. So based on that thing, uh, do you have a specific region wines that you like? I mean, now you just mentioned that the soil temperatures and all those things might uh, come into play, like the Australian um, wine. Yeah. So do you have a specific region wines that you like? Yeah, it's going to come out in the subsequent slides. So okay. I would keep it there. But again, one point I want to make is what I like may not be what you like or anybody else likes. It's a, Wine preference is a very personal choice and a very personal decision. And you should never make, you should never apologize or make excuses for why you have that. It's your call. You just need to be able to know what type of wines you like and get those wines and enjoy those. That's, uh, and tell people why you like or what you like. Uh, that is how I'll, I will look at it. I will give, I'm giving some examples in the subsequent slides on the, uh, on uh, what you call uh, certain regions, domestic regions uh, from which you can, I mean, the, generally the grape quality itself to begin with is very good. And so the wines made from the, those regions, you can, Generally, they are better quality. So I'll I'll talk about that in a in a minute. Okay. So I think uh, we can move on to the okay. next slides, and then at the end we can take the remaining questions. Okay. No problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aniruddha. Uh, the taste enhancing tips. A key part that de determines the taste is at what temperature the wine is served. And just like everything else, there is no standard rule. You go to Google, you can search, and you will find literally multiple things because for different wines, they are very precise. But generally it is, I'm just giving a very broad range and then I'll get specific. But for both red and white, it typically goes from 45 to 65 degrees. Uh, but most of the wines, white wines that you get and are generally popular and consumed in the US and some of the imported whites also, most of them, you will be okay if you serve them at 50 to 55 degree Fahrenheit. Now, red wines, it gets a little more controversial because most people say red wines should never be put in the refrigerator and serve at room temperature. But room temperature is a very, <laughs> very variable concept. If you are in Mumbai and the room temperature there is at 85 and you serve a very good red wine, it's going to affect the taste and it's going to mess it up. Uh, if you are in the US on the East Coast in summer and you maintain, let's say, 72 degrees in your home and you serve at 72 degrees, it's not as bad as being in Mumbai and serving at 85, but it will still affect the taste a little bit. So most red wines that are consumed here uh, are typically, you know, you won't go wrong if you serve between 62 to 65 degrees. So this is the rule I use. I put 
in summer, I put red wine that I'm going to serve to my friends or my family. I put it in the refrigerator for 15 minutes. And literally, if you want to see how wine affects, pour something in a glass, leave the rest in the bottle, and serve it at different temperatures and see if you want to uh, really test, uh, you know, test the, test the hypothesis here. But the key question is how, how do you, how do you uh, gauge the temperature? So there is actually, believe it or not, there is a wine thermometer. I'm going to try and show this, but uh, do I have to, uh, are you able to see it when I hold it up? Yes. Are, is everybody able to see it? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. So this is the wine thermometer and the way it is used is after you open the bottle to serve, it is, it is put there and then you remove it and you get the temperature. So, uh, that's the wine thermometer. So you serve the temperature at, I mean, serve the wine at the right temperature. You can also use aerator for heavy wines, heavy red wines. This is a very small and cheap contraption. Uh, this is, uh, uh, are you able to see it? Yes. Okay. So you pour the wine into glass from the top and because it passes through the air and it kind of here, whatever the mechanism is, it, you will see air bubbles. So it pushes air through the wine and loosens the flavor. So that is the aerator for red wine. There is a more fancy aerator like this that you put on the on the bottle and then push the button here. So it all comes, air comes through this directly into the glass. This is like, this is like hundred dollars, this contraption. So uh, anyway, that is, that is the second tool you can use to enhance taste. The third tool is the right kind of a glass. And you might think that I'm really totally anal about it and getting to ridiculous lengths, but no. Uh, there are different types of glasses for different types of wines, believe it or not. Uh, uh, there is a company called Riedel that makes expensive glasses. And I'm just gonna This is like each glass is for a different type of wine. For some wines, they have two or three different types of glasses, but uh, it's like this is a, this is a Sauvignon Blanc glass uh, and lighter wines that you can use. The interesting thing is this. Uh, this is a Pinot Noir glass. If you see the, there is a lip on the top. Uh, what is this madness about glass design? Well, the engineering and the madness about the glass design, wine glass design, is that it effortlessly puts the wine on that part of the tongue where that particular wine, varietal wine, is to be tested. Uh, so if you don't believe me, go and go to, go to Google and do a test bud, taste bud map of your tongue. And you will see that it shows sweet and salty front part of the tongue acid on the side of the tongue and bitterness, tannins on the back of the tongue. 
And so what these glasses do is it allow you to taste aroma very easily like red wine. This is a red wine glass. And the top is, the top is narrow because it, they want your nose to go in there so you get the flavors. Uh, so anyway, there are multiple different types of glass to the extent possible at least to use the right glass for white wine and the right glass for the red wine. And you get those in Macy's for like 10, $15 a set of, you know, uh, eight, eight glasses for white wine, eight glasses for red. At, le at least that will make it a little better than even if you don't want to spend money on, on, on these kinds of uh, uh, fancy glasses. It doesn't matter what kind of glass you have, but there is, you have to hold the glass right. And you might say, why, why does it affect the taste? And I'll tell you, show you in a minute. You have to hold the glass by the stem, uh, especially on the white wine, which is sort of more chilled than red wine. Because if you hold it like this, the heat of your hand and fingers reduces the temperature and affects the taste. Even on red wine, you should never, never hold the glass like that. If I'm in a party and I look around and I see people, I, it's my common thing that I see how everybody is holding the glass. And that kind of tells me who knows a little more about wine and who knows a little less. But uh, uh, and the last thing is, if you are in a restaurant or if you are even in your own home with the family or friends and you are ser serving two different types of wines, even if it's the Chardonnay, but you change the bottle, you, you, are, you are supposed to change the glass if you are switching the wine. So anyway, that may be going over the top, but that those are... Those are the tips and the etiquette for wine. Price drivers. Uh, I'm sure you have heard that price has nothing to do with wine. I mean, the quality of the wine and a lower price wine could be better than the higher price wine. Well, it depends. If you take the same wine from two different vineyards and they are within eight to ten dollars, which I call the narrow price range, yeah, that holds that the least expensive out of those, let's say you got some Chardonnay for sixteen dollars and you have another one for twenty two dollars, just because a twenty two dollar Chardonnay is costing six dollars more doesn't necessarily mean it has a better quality and a better taste. So, but the price is a good end indicator of quality when you go from, let's say, $20 bottle to $50 bottle or more. So that is how we can put that question or argument to rest. What what drives the price of wine? It's really multiple things. It's the grape. Uh, grapes like Pinot Noir are, they don't grow everywhere. They can't grow everywhere versus grape like Merlot. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the movie Sideways where they really talked about Merlot and compared Merlot to Pinot, Pinot Noir. Uh, so because Pinot Noir can be grown only in certain regions, the total volume of Pinot Noir grapes produced is much less. As a result, any Pinot Noir is typically more expensive than a Merlot. Simple. Uh, is it vintage or not? And 
vintage, what that means is the year in which the grapes were harvested. If you see a vintage label on a wine bottle, what that means is it is, it is uh, about 80 to 85% of the grapes used in making that wine are from a single year. Uh, and you might wonder why, why, it's, why is that? Uh, well, think about the problem of a vineyard. They are selling the wine nationally, like Kendall Jackson. They, they need large volumes of grapes. And depending on the taste of the grape and the climate, and variety of things, the taste may not be same. So then they have to mix, get grapes from other, other years that are frozen and used to maintain the taste. So that is what vintage means. Uh, different countries have different rules and let's not go into that much detail, but it's like uh, South Africa and Chile, uh, their requirement is only 75% of the grapes used from a given year, then you can call it a vintage. Uh, California and most other countries is about 85. And I think certain regions on Napa are 95%. So that's why when you see the vintage Lab, on the label, it, it commands a little more price and it's a little more assurance of a better quality wine. Age of the wine, as we talked about uh, for a few minutes. Uh, length of the time, wine is matured in oak casks. Uh, good balance and good finish generally get higher price. And then the new school versus old school. Uh, New school, like I said, is what that means is very uh, environmentally conscious way made. So stainless steel, uh, ferment, fermentation in stainless steel as opposed to oak barrels and made with a very environmental conscious way with uh, little or no additives and all that jazz. Uh, so depends. So new school also could be as expensive as old school if it is like completely organic, it has organic label and all that jazz because organic label means they are not using any pesticides. They are not using insecticides and that doesn't seep into the soil and get into the wine. So that's, uh, that's also uh, new school uh, wine. And of course, the overall taste as to how this is where the winemaker puts his or her skills into the mix. Now let's talk about, you go to wine shops a lot of times. I mean, unless you want to buy the same type of wine every time, uh, it's difficult and you are going to buy wines that you have not tasted and wine shop is not going to give you. So what is, uh, what are some of the tips? Uh, it's like, do not buy white wine that is more than five years old. I would even say three years, but definitely not more than five years because of the limited shelf life of white wine, unless it is, really preserved by a very good vineyard in a very uh, laborious way. So uh, that's one thing. Do not buy red wine that is five years old or more, unless it is a little more pricey and, and it's well preserved. The, the idea being that only good wines that are preservable would be kept and matured 
for more than five years. And again, vineyard and the wine master decide that. So, uh, and again, that will push up the price. So if you get 10 or $15 red wine that is more than five years old, the bet is that it is beginning to spoil or it may have already spoiled a little bit. So that's the reason for that. There is vintage label on a good bet. That's a good bet on a good value. Uh, I just described that in detail. Estate, estate bottle, reserve, these are all good bets. Uh, uh, usually when you have estate bottle, what that means is the vineyard has done everything, including bottling uh, themselves. So it stays under one company's control and it doesn't get additional fermentation in the process of transportation from the vineyard to the, uh, to the bottler if they are sending that. That's why estate, estate bottle, reserve, these are, these are good things to really see and have. Uh, now I'm going to give the regions from domestic regions for somebody had asked questions and I deferred it to later slide. So good domestic wines are, domestic regions are from white wines from Sonoma, red wines from Napa, Washington State, Oregon State, these are these are up and coming, Washington and Oregon. They are making good quality wines. White wines for that. You, I'm, I'm talking about Sonoma, Washington State, Oregon. Good domestic reds are Napa, Russian River Valley, and Willamette Valley. And Paso Robles, which is a region north of Santa Barbara. Uh, all, all the Cabernets from Paso Robles, you will, you, I think they are very well made. Uh, they are a little bit on the Swedish side, but uh, compared to other Cabernets, but I think those are good. I like cabs from Paso Robles. Uh, if you are ready for experimentation and you don't know much, or you are still learning, you can tell the wine shop what type of wine you like and the price range. And the final tip I'll tell you is a lot of times wine shops play this trick to really justify a little higher price without corresponding quality. Uh, they will show you like wine enthusiast, wine spectator score of 92 or 94 on the label. Uh, that, and that is like out of 100, that score. So, and then they will have the wine and you say, oh, I don't really need to learn about wines. I can just go to the wine shop, whatever they are saying. 99.9% .9 of the times, that rating is for a given year. And what you will find is they have the same vineyard and the same grape, but the year is different. And year makes all the difference because every crop is different. So be careful. Actually, I would say I, I personally do not buy those type of wines because in every instance that I have checked, that's not the year in which the wine got that high rating. So anyway, that is, I think we are on one last one or two slides now. Uh, Buying wine at a restaurant. Let the sommelier know what kind of wine you like. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to at least pick up on a couple of aspects of wine tasting that we covered. But again, what I said in the beginning, if I go there and go to a restaurant, sommelier asks me, I say, I like semi dry. And of course, I tell them I want white or red, but after that, I say, I like semi-dry, medium to heavy body, little bit of oak, and a good finish. And that gives them an idea. 
and they will they will recommend two or three bottles that you can buy another tip <laughs> this is a this is a wine consultant who shared that with me how many times have you gone to a restaurant even if it's just you and your wife or your family and ordered a bottle and then you hesitate from buying the cheapest bottle on the on their list wine list uh, and you go just to show that you are not cheap you go to the second or third it happens more on the business type of lunches uh, well that's bad and restaurants know that nobody likes to buy the cheapest wine so the second or the third least expensive wine is about the same in quality as the least expensive wine but they just got more money from you so don't do that always ask for the year of the wine even after the sommelier tells you and see the label to verify and if you are buying wine by the glass never buy a glass of red wine that is the most expensive on the menu the reason is most people who buy wines by the glass they just have one glass and then they of a good wine red wine then they preserve it but it still the air still goes in affects the taste and if you, you don't know how long it is sitting there and that happens more on red wines and i have sent those back and the bartender has admitted that yeah it was sitting there for a little bit i'll give you from a fresh bottle that's what they will say but anyway uh that is buying at a restaurant i am going to talk about important wine tasting trivia the first one you can google this by judgment of paris 1976 will give you a lot of information but this is the judgment of paris that put the california wine industry on the world map that's why it's important uh until then californian wines were really looked at as if eh, you guys are kiddos you are just learning how to make wines that was the european attitude and mostly the french attitude and they had a contest of blind testing where i think uh, several wine experts were going to do blind testing and of course there were most of the entries were french and italian and uh, there were two vineyards that sent wines uh one white and one red one of the it's uh chateau montelina was the was the vineyard uh that uh, and there was i i'm forgetting the second one but those two vineyards sent their bought their wines one white one red as american entries and guess what in a blind tasting uh uh contest the french judges determine that these two wines beat out the french wines so uh that's when europe and france took notice and california used it for their business so that's that's the first one the second thing is europeans always scoff at california and americans and their wine making uh uh but remember if you ever meet somebody like that you have to say california saved the world wine industry back in 1850s there was a very bad uh there was a very bad uh kind of uh, infection that the vineyards got and most of the europe and almost all of french vineyards were going to be destroyed and it went on for several years uh, three four years and uh, then the, uh, some of the viticulturists realized that the california wine roots the vineyard roots 
were very strong and they were resisting this uh, uh, bacteria called phylloxera and so they they came up with an experiment and grafted the california vineyard uh, uh, roots into with with the french and the italian and that revived the french and the european wine industry finally institute of masters of wine there is an institute believe it or not and of all places that is it, it is in a country and in a city that is not known for wines it's in london uh, it started 65 years ago and they have an exam that they give every year uh, and you get a, when you pass that you get a degree called master of wine every year about seven or eight of them pass no more than 10 and just to allow just to be allowed to appear for the exam pushes up your wine consulting rate as a consultant or your salary so it's very prestigious and only one example i'll give you they give you blind tasting wines about 12 and you you have to blind test them and typically talk about the region in the world from which the grape came which is i think very difficult but anyway so if you have the interest and inclination look these up on google and you will find interesting more interesting uh, information now this is the last slide but then i am going to end on a note that after hearing this presentation and after knowing a little bit that i have tried to give you hopefully you will do better than the man who is at the wine shop asking for wine in the next last slide and a cartoon he's saying i don't remember the name but it had a taste that i liked <laughs> so hopefully you won't do that and you will have you will be a little more specific and that's my presentation thank you for being there thank you for listening if there are any questions depending on time and everything else aniruddha i'll take take few yeah definitely so we have few questions so i will go and i will try to uh, merge uh, the two or three or some questions are already answered by your uh, slides okay so uh, one question is that uh, please share your thoughts uh, in general what kind of wines go best with what kind of indian non vegetarian dishes like wines that complement indian spices in lamb chicken and fish aha okay so we are getting into food pairing and i had not uh, uh, because i wanted to limit the presentation within the time frame i had not talked about it but let me give you a general rule and again that is an old rule now people are beginning to experiment but generally you have wine that is opposite of the kind of food that you are eating meaning chardonnays were popular because american diet was very bland and had meat in it uh, so that's how chardonnays became spicy you will be surprised the drink i mean the wine that is considered ideally suited for any kind of indian uh, dish because indian dishes are spicy and there is a german wine and a german grape called gerwurztraminer that is what is recommended ideally for with indian spicy food and they if you don't like that or you don't want that garvatsaminer is a little on the sweetish side not very sweet but it's still on the sweetish side and beer that is what is recommended with spicy indian dishes now people have started experimenting with with food pairings and chefs get very very creative 
uh, we were for some important occasion, we were in that little inn in Washington uh, where they have the eight course, uh, eight course uh, dinner with wines uh, paired, wine and food paired for eight courses. Uh, they give very little quantity, so you don't drink more than two, two glasses if you stay for all the eight courses, but they generally, white wine is recommended uh, with seafood, but on a seafood uh, delicacy uh, that had a uh, raspberry sauce, they actually paired it with red wine, which is very unusual. But so pairing can go uh, every which way. Uh, typically different type of cheeses, blue cheese, and uh, uh, there is one other specialty cheese that goes very well with most white wines. Uh, and that kind of enhances the flavor, uh, even for rosé, rosé wines. So hopefully I gave you, I'm sorry I disappointed you with, didn't come up with a very popular wine that we all drink normally, but uh, that's okay. Occasionally, but basically what you want to, what, what you want to get is uh, a little a wine that is on a sweeter side. So I would even say, Go with Vionier, V I G O N I E R. And if you are from Virginia, Virginia soil is very conducive to generating very good quality Vionier grapes. So uh, you, uh, you get good wines from the smaller Virginia wineries if you can, but Vionier is, is good. It's, little on the sweetest side and you can, uh, that will go well with, uh, with uh, Indian spicy meat dishes. Great, thank you. So on the similar line, uh, what is the best wine for cooking? Oh boy, I, I don't know. I'm looking at my wife who is sitting here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I only drink. My wife cooks, so I'm okay. zero in cooking. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. So the next question is that, how do we keep wine safe to consume at a latter point of, after opening a bottle? So is refrigeration an option? Yeah, I would say yes. Definitely white wines uh, have to be refrigerated. But I, if, if I... My wife and I, when we drink, it's four to five ounces, each one of us. And wine has 25 ounces. So uh, we obviously have to uh, cork the bottle and keep it. So even red wines, we will put, I, I recommend refrigeration, definitely. But there are simple, uh, wine preserving tools. I'm, I'm showing you this. Uh, this is a very simple one. These days, it, it's very old, has lasted eight, 10 years, but these days you don't get this kind of a thing easily. There is another one also. Uh, basically, you put this in the wine bottle half finished, and then you are basically pumping the air out like this. And as you pump a few times, as the air gets out, it becomes harder and harder to do this. And when it's very hard to do it, that's when you stop and put it. And you'll be amazed as to how, uh, how, it is, how well it is preserved. You, you lose a little bit of a taste, but uh, not much. This is another type of the same kind of, uh, uh, these are the newer ones that you get. So that's, hopefully I answered that question. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. And, and uh, another thing is thing, that... One thing, there, there are more expensive uh, wine preserving systems that you get. There is, the one that I have seen is like $200. Uh, 
Uh, it's very fine needle, so you don't have to remove the cork even, but you put the you put the uh, needle that is connected through the cork and it's connected to a tube, and then uh, it pumps the bottle, I mean the wine directly into your glass, but you have not removed the cork because the needle is so fine and then the cork kind of joins again after you remove it. The reason I don't like it is, there are two reasons. Uh, there are many vineyards that have switched to the metal, metallic uh, screw top uh, kind of a cork. So the expensive wine, uh, expensive uh, wine preservation system won't work on that. And the other thing is that that uh, tool actually pumps. Uh, I think uh, which one? It pumps. I think one type of gas. Uh, I'm forgetting the name. In in it to preserve it. And I don't like additional gases and chemicals and all that. That's why I have not. But there are there are expensive ones available for that. So anyway, right. so the next one is that how to make sense of wine ratings? Are they trustworthy? <laughs> okay, this is uh, uh, this is a good one. And again, because I wanted to kind of limit it to tasting, I didn't get into a rating. But thank you for this question because it's very relevant. Ah. Uh, wine rating they are typically from zero to hundred and i'll give you the i'll give you the uh, kind of uh, ranges like 83 to 86 rating is considered drinkable and good uh, 87 to 89 is considered very good 90 and 91 is considered exceptional 92 to 94 and above is considered investment quality meaning the wine if you preserve it well it will go go up in price uh, so that's that's how the rating ranges work now a little bit of history <clears throat> uh, originally there was no rating nobody in europe nobody in california there was a gentleman named Robert Parker, an American who invented this scale and he came out with that scale uh, and that became very popular because at that time there was nothing else available uh, and he really cornered the market. He made millions on just that. Uh, so for a while, that was the only system and Europe and especially French and Italian winemakers rebelled because they said this is all geared towards making California wines rate higher. It's tilted towards California and it may be, I don't know the exact history, but that is how it came. And now since wines have grown in popularity and in consumption nationwide, everybody has started doing uh, doing uh, these ratings. So the, the one that are that I rely on and are a good indicator are the is the wine spectator, which is very similar to the original Robert Parker and he may have sold his to wine spectator. but that is very reliable compared to some of the other ones. Uh, wine enthusiast is better than many others, but not as good as the wine spectator. And then there are a lot of others that I, I don't really put too much credence in it because uh, everybody gets up these days, comes out with a uh, variation of the rating system and then they call it uh, so. Hopefully I answered that. So look for, again, generally when the wine is 90 to 91 rated, uh, it would go into the 20s, definitely, uh, maybe high 20s. Uh, but if you are able to uh, get 
89, 88 rated wine around $15. That's not bad. That's good value. So hopefully that, that helps you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the last one is that, uh, what do you think of blended wines? I mean, these days, blend of two or three wines of different types is becoming quite popular. Yes, that's the craze. <laughs> uh, the younger generation likes it. It's very popular. And the vineyards like it because guess what? It just makes their job much simpler. Uh, I personally do not like blended wines uh, for the simple reason is I look at, I look at, at a wine as a sort of a work of craftsmanship and work of art. Uh, and when you blend wine, do you know how they, how they come up with the blended wine uh, formula? They, it's literally trial and error. You, you mix this much of this grape, this much of this grape, and then they give it to a small focus group of wine uh, tasters. And they say, which one did you like? And then based on the profile, and then they would do that. That, that according to me, is not winemaking, but some now the California vineyards like Robert Mondavi, William Hill, they have started making very expensive blended wines and they are good for tasting and I like them, but I wouldn't pay 70, $75 for a blended wine bottle. And I won't buy a $20 blended wine bottle because just again, that's just my preference. It depends on how you look at it. But then most young people with limited wallets, who cares? If you like it and it's a good value, it's cheaper, fine, enjoy. If you like it, fine, don't make excuses. So that's my stand on, uh, uh, on blended wines. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Parag Ambarudakarji. And I think uh, we really appreciate having you giving this informative session. Uh, I see in the chat, there are so many uh, kudos and thanks to you uh, from many people. And I will send you the chat later on. Uh, but definitely uh, it would have been much uh, more, uh, what I will say is that much more interesting if we could have really did the face to face with the wine testing, but definitely we will see it after post COVID-19 days. Uh, definitely uh, we will uh, try to arrange some. Yeah, kind of I'm, I'm open that and that's how I normally do this. And it may have been a little dry and a little more theoretical, but at least it, it gives you some information. But I forgot one important thing. Uh, I was going to do that in the beginning, but I'm doing it now. So I'm sorry about that. I want to thank Marathi Kalamandar, Uttaranga, uh, and all the people who joined today. Uh, first of all, Marathi Kalamandar and Uttaranga to give me the chance to present this. Uh, this is one of my hobbies. I don't do it for money, but uh, so thank you very much. And uh, also want to thank Aniruddha Bhakre uh, and Rajani Zoglekar because I was I was working with them about this uh, and all the help that they gave uh, in terms of arranging and organizing the program. And finally, without you guys participating, I wouldn't be, you know, uh, this program wouldn't have got me going. So thank you. And I have my email there. You are welcome to, uh, welcome to, send me email uh, that I showed on the slide. Uh, I don't give the cell phone only because I screen calls and if I don't know you, I won't accept it. That's the reason, but uh, you can get the email from Aniruddha, which is on my very first title slide. And you can, you can feel free. I, I, that's really my hobby and it's my passion. So anyway, thank you. Yep. And, uh,
we'll thank you perfect. thank you so much everyone and lastly just to end it uh, uh, again i will reiterate the uh, um, disclaimer what uh, parag ambedkar ji has put it uh, mkm marathi kala mandal and uttarang uh, uh, nor uh, parag ambedkar himself encourage uh, the alcohol consumption uh as well as uh, this program is entirely for adults uh, of age 21 and above so thank you for attending and we will uh, have this kind of session definitely sometime later okay thank you thank